Welcome to Fun with Annuities with your host, me, Stan the Annuity Man, America's annuity agent. Can annuities be fun? Can contractual guarantees be fun? Absolutely they can. Find out the brutal facts about annuities with no sales pitches or high pressure nonsense. Just the brutal and factual annuity truth, which is all you need to hear. Let's have some fun with annuities and let's have that fun start right now. Welcome to Fun with Annuities. I'm your host, Stan the Annuity Man, America's annuity agent, licensed in all 50 states. I am so glad you joined me for this. You saw the title, you saw who was on it. You know he's a superstar. And if you clicked and you say, you know, I wonder who this person is, then you need to crawl out of the rock that you're living under because today's guest is financial royalty himself, Paul Merriman. Oh, Paul, man. Paul, thank you Stan. so much for joining Stan. us again. I'm playing this one for my wife. She's got to hear this. That's yeah. <laughs> you're very every kind. Time, every time I'm on man. with Paul, thank you. I, yeah, Paul is an interesting cat in my opinion because he's one of those guys that if you're hanging out with him or talking to him, there's no way to be depressed. He's like glass half full. And that's one of the things I love about him because I'm not always like that, but he is. He just seems to me mm -hmm. like he's living life for the day. He's living like my, my motto, I always tell my clients, there's no U-Hauls behind hearses, so you need to maximize every single day. And I think he's, um, you know, he's, that, he's that guy. Now, as with all of our celebrity guests, the last time Paul was on, and hopefully be on in the future, but this time as well, we're gonna have replays, we'll have links to everything. We've got some mm -hmm. special links we're gonna put up there for, with some of his portfolios. And he, he has no problem with that because he's all about helping people, which, which leads us into my first question, Paul, mm -hmm. um, you always say there's seven things that you're trying to help people do. There's seven things. You've narrowed them down to seven. Let's go over those seven. What are those seven? Well, by the way, if they would let me, I'd give them 20, okay? But my <laughs> wife won't let me go above seven. But, go. but basically, it's this. I am not an investment advisor anymore. I haven't been an investment advisor since 2012. I am 100% teacher. Mm -hmm. And what I'm trying to do is for do-it-yourself investors to give them the information they need to make the same decision I would want them to make if I were an advisor to them. But in order to do that, I have to produce all of the tables and the information that I would lay out to a prospective client. So all of a sudden, the do-it-yourself investor is not only the client, but the advisor. Mm -hmm. So what do they need to know? These are the, the big seven. Number one, what equity asset classes should they have in their portfolio? Which are the asset classes that historically do the best? And none of them are good all the time, but. That leads to the next thing you need to know is how do you combine those different equity asset classes to give you a portfolio so that maybe when one is weak, another is strong. And there's tons, tons of evidence going all the way back to 1928 that we share with people in this regard. And then how much fixed income? Yes, the equity is the gas and the fixed income is the break. I'm 78 years old. I have no way I'm going to have my foot all gas. I'm about 50 break and 50 gas. <laughs> but for a young person, it should be all gas. And so how much fixed income? And we show the information to help people decide what should be that combination. And then we get into, okay, if you are accumulating what are the things you should do in terms of putting the portfolio together for an accumulator? And then, of course, there's the person who's in distribution. That's mm -hmm. the retiree. And we show them, I mean, dozens and dozens of tables that reflect two very major ways to take money out of those investments and we show it to them at 3% and 4 and 5 and 6. What right. would happen historically uh, to, to a person's money? And then, of course, everybody needs a glide path. Now, you may not think of it when you do it, but the glide path starts when a child is born, in theory. 
we encourage parents and grandparents to take steps immediately to put that child on a glide path, which means all equities when they're young, I'm talking for long-term money, and then as they get older, more and more and more fixed income. And then finally, what I personally believe is you can give people all of these numbers to study these, these different combinations, but if you don't give them the names of the ETFs, the names of the Vanguard, the Fidelity, the T. Rowe Price, the Schwab funds to do it with, they probably won't do it. So we have done, and I'm sorry to, to talk so much, Stan, but we've done everything that we know to put that information in front of somebody. So if they know themselves, and this is the challenge, I can't know you. I can only know the history of combinations of different kinds of investments. Right. You have to figure out you if you're going to do it yourself. And as you know in your business, Stan, mm -hmm. most people don't don't know themselves as well as they should. No, and they don't. that is a huge challenge. So let's go through them one at a time. Number one is what? So people, you don't have to write it down, everyone, but I want you to kind of pro process it in your head. That's what I want. So let's go. Number one is what? Bullet point. Well, number one is to figure out a way to identify what equity asset classes you should have. You see, Warren Buffett said that to be a success, you only have to do a very few things right as long as you don't do too many things wrong. Well, Wall Street's got about, <laughs> what, about 500 different things they'd like you to do? Exactly. I don't have 500 things I'd like you to do. I'd like to make, I do make the case for having, yes, some S&P 500 and some large cap value right. and some small. I mean, there are asset classes that have a very long history. And then that next item, of course, is to so, figure out how to put them together. So that's number two, is figure out yeah. how to put them together. Okay. Now let me whet your appetite with just one of these portfolios, tested back to 1928. It's a very simple portfolio. 25% each, S&P 500, large cap value, small cap blend, small cap value. When you put those four together, not only do you get a better return than the S&P 500 by about 2% a year, but you do it at way less risk. Do those not, again. Not when Give you look one day at a time, again. Stan. Not one day, one week, one month. I understand. But over a matter of a few years, way less volatile. And do those percentages again, Paul. 25% each. S&P 500, the granddaddy of them all. Mm -hmm. High, high quality, mostly growth. Right. And then large value companies that are all kind of out of favor in one way or mm -hmm. another. And then we all know that small over time is more risky. And so we want some small blend, a small blend is some value and some growth. Mm -hmm. And then we want some because the, the, the gold ring of investing historically is small cap value. The mm -hmm. premium is at least historically, I've always got to say that because none of us can know what the future is going to bring, but at least looking backwards, it is by far the biggest return. And by the way, interestingly enough, mm -hmm. the risk is not as high as people might expect for the huge difference in return. So that's number three, right? Well, uh, you know, I think. Or We're two. at maybe number two. That's number two. Let's, what's yeah, number three? Okay. Number three is, okay, are you made for an all equity portfolio? Mm. See, I'd like to see a young person until they're 40 years of age probably be all in equities because for every 10% more in equities you have, you make about a half a percent more per year and a half a percent is golden. But at some point, we start moving towards our golden years. Right. And we start cutting back because when we're young, we have lots of time to earn money. But when we get older, that that ability to earn money to support ourselves diminishes and we got to make sure the portfolio is built to sustain us uh, in the rest of our life. Now, having said that, if somebody said, well, is it okay to be all equities for your whole life? Sure. Of course it's okay. Sure. As a matter of fact, You'd probably retire with tons more money. Exactly. You would probably die with tons more money, but you'd always be sitting on a bed of securities 
that are likely to collapse and could be a collapse of not just 50% or 60%, but could be 70%. And you may not want to take that risk. And it's all about risk tolerance. And I tell people all the time, do not call me if you're less than 50 years old about annuities, please mm. follow Paul. And even at 50, okay, even between that 50 to 55 range, I'll talk to you, yeah. but there's a very good chance for me to say, no, 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 too early. But, but if you're less than 50 and some sociopath trying to sell you an annuity, please, please just listen to Paul and I, you need to be in growth and growth means not an annuity. So what's number four, Paul? But, but, but Stan, I got to ask because- yes. Because you've just said something that people might, when I say misinterpret, because, you know, annuity equals fixed income. That's not true. What though. do but you that's say? Not true. If they're going to pick fixed income, okay. would you recommend an annuity, a bond, a CD? What would you recommend? Okay. And we're talking, let's, let's dig in a little bit, <clears throat> because this is where, this is where some of my people in the financial industry kind of get it, not you, but others that I've interviewed get it wrong. When you're talking about fixed income, you're talking about bonds, corporate, munis, treasuries. You're, you're also talking about um, CDs, okay? You're talking about those type of things. Now, the annuity industry has one product type called a multi-year guarantee annuity that, that functions like a CD. It, it, it's guarantee, guaranteed interest rate for a specific period of time that you choose, fully principal protected, no moving parts, no annual fees. If you said, Stan, that, you know, that MIGA looks like a CD and acts like a CD. That's because it's the annuity industry's version of a CD. And now where people make mistakes in the industry is saying things like an index annuity is like a bond. It is not like a bond. Okay. Um, so in the fixed income space where you're talking about protecting your principal and getting a coupon off of it in the annuity industry, and, and I'm right about this, regardless of who's going to email me the hate mail, it's multi-year guarantee annuities. You can buy them as short as one year in duration. You can ladder them one, two, three, four, and five. I don't let people go past five because that's where the yield curve analysis stops us. But do not let anybody, and there's some smart people saying, well, index annuities are like bonds. No, they're not. Bonds have a guaranteed coupon. Multi-year guarantee annuities have a guaranteed coupon. CDs have a guaranteed coupon. Index mm -hmm. annuities don't have a guaranteed coupon. They have a minimum guarantee, so, but that doesn't count. Okay. So Stan, I can tell you, I can tell you right now, the people that are going to hear this because we're going to send it to our, mm -hmm. uh, our mailing list, they're going to want to know, okay, then just tell us what is about the return of the CD versus this annuity sure. product you're recommending? Well, at the time of this taping, I really want people to look at that. Look at that date right now before I go mm -hmm. into this, because I, I, you know, these rates will change and they're all going to change. But Number one, multi-year guarantee annuities, fixed annuities are regulated at the state level. So depending on the state you live in, it's going to be different. And you can go to my site at theannuityman.com and pull a live feed of all states and filter it. But right now, say a three-year at the time of this taping, and, um, and we're in March of 2022, okay? Time of this taping, it's 2.65 on a three-year, 2.9 on a four year, over 3% on a five year. They don't really reward you going past that. Two years getting two to 2.1% depending on your state. Once again, don't hold me to all those. Go to my site and look at your specific state. But in a ladder format, and everyone knows where CDs are at this point in time, you can do a two, three, four, and a five year ladder and get say 2.15, 2.65, 2.9, and then 3.1 on a ladder principal protected, no annual fees, no moving parts, no indexes, and you have full control over the asset. Now, when you compare that to CDs at the time of this taping, um, it's, not, it's not comparable because annuity companies have, have more pricing mechanisms than a bank does. They're only, mm -hmm. they're slave to the 10-year or the 30-year treasury, whereas a life insurance company has multiple products they can price on them. I don't want to go into the annuity hole because people want to hear you, Paul. No, but I, no, I, I understand. But, it, <clears throat> but you know something? It's, it's about choices. And, and we rarely get a chance to get the full education. And I've always called you one of the truth tellers. So uh, I, I appreciate, appreciate having a chance to hear that. Go, go right ahead. The, Where walking, are we? the walking middle finger of annuity truth is what my wife calls me. Number, <laughs> number, number four, Paul, what's number four? Oh, let's see. Number four. Uh, oh, my golly. We got to the uh, fine tuning. Well, we're going to get into the uh, district. Actually, it starts with distributions. Let's got talk it. about distributions. Distributions come in two forms. 
The first form is fixed. Mm -hmm. Now that is the person who has not saved too much. They've saved just enough mm -hmm. to retire. So they don't have much wiggle room. They can't be far off in terms of the returns they're going to get and how much they're going to take out. Sure. And so with that restriction, we figure that if they take out 4%, let's say out of a million dollars, mm -hmm. they are going to have to inflation adjust that every year or they're gonna, or, or, or they're gonna get behind and they will not have the, the living standard that they thought they were going to have. So right. we have to every year adjust that. So we look at the tables that pay out three, four, five, six, and adjust okay. them every year going back to 1970 for real inflation, not hypothetical inflation, right. because you need to see what the risks are to your portfolio. Right. And so that's one, but then there's another level of distributions and it's a, it's, it's a whole different look at, at, at this decision-making process. And that is what we call, I'm going to call it the person who's oversaved. They have room to make a mistake. They can right. take out more. They can invest a little more aggressively. There are a whole bunch of things that are beneficial to them because they oversaved. Right. I even waited to retire financially until I was 70 so that I had what I thought was the protection from the worst case situation for right. my wife and myself. So in that case, it's not fixed. It's variable. Right. So at the first of each year, my wife and I take out 5% of whatever it was worth, 1231, and that's our money for this year. <laughs> And so that's our budget, theoretically. I'd like to believe it would be our budget. But sure. That's the idea. And we break that up into monthly, even monthly payments over the year. What you'd find out is that by going to these multiple, uh, the, this variable or flexible payment, is that it protects you in the bad times. And right. the very thing that would leave you broke with fixed uh, extraction distributions could leave you in fat city by using a variable distribution. Mm -hmm. It's magic. It's, it's absolutely wonderful to see how that little difference between forcing yourself to take money out and having the, the, the ability to take a variable amount. And then we have to talk about the glide path. Every is that number five? Is five the glide path? Oh my God! If I've lost, if I I may have left out contributions. I'll I'll get back to. It doesn't matter. We're, I'm I'm just checking the boxes off. Go ahead. <laughs> I in, in in the area about uh, the glide path, everybody should theoretically have a glide path. The number one product in America for as an investment in a 401k and second and third and fourth place together are all way behind the target date fund. What does the target date fund do? And by the way, you can have a target date fund till you die mm -hmm. if you want to. But the idea is that a young person, for example, can today buy a target date fund that knows they want to retire in 2065 and they manage the money until 2065, mm -hmm. knowing when, according to the managers of those funds, when to add some bonds, how much in bonds, how much right. in equities, what equities, and all of those kinds of things. That, that movement from all equity to some fixed income, that's called the glide path. And the target date does that for people. Here's the, if there, there is one secret that I think is really powerful, and I don't know if you call it a secret because it was from a study that Wharton did that showed on 1.2 million accounts that people who used a target date fund were set up to make 2.3% more per year than the people who are doing it on their own. Wow. And if that isn't an argument for most people, <laughs> Uh, to use a target date fund. I don't know what argument there, but there is one thing I would add. This goes back to this, what we learned about equities. I could show you, and we, in fact, we have a free book that we send to people, but I could show you how if you just added 10% small cap value to that target date fund, it would make you an extra one half of 1% at least historically, wow. which would add about an extra million to two uh, through your lifetime. I'm just, I'm just saying that it's worth looking at. And, 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 
and finally, uh, it is knowing what individual investments to put your money into. Yep. And so we have it right there. I mean, we give the list. We have a fellow, Chris, Chris Patterson is our director of research. Smart guy. He has got Smart the guy. smoothest list of recommended ETFs, what he calls best in class, to build a portfolio. And as I mentioned earlier, we do it at Vanguard, we do it at Schwab. And give people that website, Paul. Give them that website. I'm going to have it on my site as well, but I know people are yelling at the uh, speaker right now saying, please give me the website. What is that website? <laughs> okay. It's just paulmerriman.com. Two R's. M-E-R-R-I-M-A-N. Two R's. M-E-R-R-I-M-A-N.com. If you haven't and, ever uh, favorited a, a website, you might want to do that one. And, and Paul sent me a list of the, the current, current portfolios, his non, no-nonsense portfolio, which I love. Uh, no-nonsense for sound investing. He sent me that. All of this is available to you. And you can look at it, and you can, they're updating it. I mean, if you, don't, if you didn't know about Paul and what he's doing, you do now. And um, it, it's just he's, he's, he's literally giving money away to you to make you richer if you just follow some basic steps you can hear the passion in his voice because he's proven it over time what paul 50 years you 50 years in this thing now? Uh, almost 60 as a matter of fact Jeez. that's how long i've been around this business yeah i just i, I would just make one comment about you mentioned the no nonsense mm -hmm. uh and we've got a list it includes not only the no nonsense, but already some of the highlights from the 150 portfolios better than yours off of the White Coat Investor website. Yeah. And here's what this shows you. There is a really, there are some secrets to successful building of portfolios. Yep. And in those tables, I show you some of the most famous, the Bogleheads, uh, mm -hmm. uh, Rick Ferries, uh, <laughs> the coffee house uh, investor, a whole right. bunch of people who have great portfolios, but how did they really do over the last 52 years? And we show you how they did, not just in the good times, but in the bad times. Yep. And it's pretty easy to see that risk versus return once you see those results. Um, for the people that are, that there's a, a couple of, um audio glitches we're having, not nothing major, Paul, but you know, Paul's in this beautiful state of Washington. Are you in Oregon? Oh no, I'm right now I'm in Washington. Do I not have a good connection? No, it's pretty good. It's 98% good, which is enough for us to, okay. to get the gold out. And I'm in, I'm in uh, the sunny, rainy state of Florida, so we're, we're a long ways away. I was gonna ask you something. You sent me um, an email with a, with, you know, I'd ask you a couple questions. You responded. One of the things that just jumped out at me is, um, you know, kids today, they trust crypto more than they trust the S and P 500. Tell me, how did we get here, Paul? How do we, that's insanity, number one, but why are, why is that happening? And, and what's the long-term effect of that? If we don't correct that perception, well, it's what I spent a lot of my life trying to do. I talked to college kids yesterday, Stan, and, and it's kind of uh, one small group at a time for me. But the bottom line is this. There is a difference between the price you pay for something and the value you get. And today, mm -hmm. with the internet, uh, anything can be sold. It's amazing the kinds of things people are led to believe. I know. As a matter of fact, it's not just the bad information about the the risk levels of cryptocurrency versus the S&P 500. I mean, that just, that just really worries me that people would think that the cryptocurrency is a safer investment than the S&P 500. But, you know, I can't, I can't save everybody. But I will tell you this, because of social media, there are people who are preaching investment advice that is absolutely absolutely terrible. Agreed. I'm not going to name his name. Agreed. And I'm going to think probably, Stan, I'm, uh, I hope you won't mention <clears throat> it. But when I mention what I tell you they believe in, I know you're you'll know about. exactly who it is. Yep. And that is a person who tells people it is good to buy a loaded fund and pay the commission up front. And let me tell you about that. That means 
that you put in $1,000 and $50 right. goes into somebody else's pocket to compound for the rest of your life. Now, if what that person said is, if you are smart enough to understand what an index fund is, mm -hmm. and you can buy it with very low expenses, you can buy it without a commission, and that would be a great thing to do. But if you want to do something else, then go pay somebody a commission to buy a fund that is likely to do worse than that index fund. That to mm -hmm. me is even worse than some of the stuff about cryptocurrency. Because Cryptocurrency will be wiped out, but, but, but these other pieces of advice are going to continue for people's lives, and it's going to cost them early retirement. It's going to cost them money in retirement. They're going to leave less to their kids because they're getting bad advice, and it's because they know how to work social media. Yeah, they didn't and have I, that it, when I was a kid. And it's sad. I, 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 I'm a student of all things financial like you are. And, and it's, um, we have to pay attention on the blockchain technology and crypto because yeah. the reason I'm doing that is it's fascinating to me the demographics that are buying it. I think it's 55 or 57% of all crypto owners are, are uh, millennials of color, uh, um, white, black, Asian, lower income is also a big holder of that. And I think, Paul, that they think it's, it's a dream. It's maybe a get rich quick. It's maybe an easy problem solver. That's a good sell, but it's not reality. And, I, and, it, and it, it almost sickens me because if these people would have taken this money that they put in crypto and just put it in, just put in an S&P 500 Vanguard fund that with the lowest cost on, on the planet and forgot about it, yeah. they'd be better well, off. And in my book, we're talking millions, 12 simple ways to supercharge your retirement. Mm -hmm. I give them $12 million decisions. Yep. One of them is not to put money into cryptos. One of them is not to put money into a loaded fund. <laughs> I mean, if you look at the list, they're all common sense, but every one of them, if you know how to figure this out, mm -hmm. are worth a million dollars to any young person in their 20s. I've sure. been, at my age, it's a little late. <laughs> but in their 20s, there's plenty of room to do the right thing. No, I agree. Um, I know that and what I like about your site and what you do and what, what, your, what your organization does is you're not affected by, by cable news pundits and what people say. What do you tell people during these black swan events? And when I say that, you know, at the time of this taping, um, you know, Russia invading Ukraine, you know, maybe China invades Taiwan down the road, you know, um, uh, the um, COVID, hyperinflation at 7%. What are you telling people? Because I'm sure they're calling and saying, you know, they're worried or they're trying to figure it out. There's no good answers, just bad sales pitches. What are you, what are you telling people to calm them down here? Well, I had to laugh when in the introduction of me, you said I'm a very optimistic person. You are. Uh, I, I have a lot of optimism about, uh, about humans. But what I do worry about, <laughs> and I have always worried about, is the catastrophic event that's about to happen around the corner. I agree. And a black swan event, of course, may be a black swan event in our society and, and in the world, mm -hmm. doesn't mean it's going to be a black market or swan event in the stock market. Uh, the, the reality is, that markets go up and down. That's one of the things you'll see in our work. We show you exactly the amount of risk. Well, when I say exactly the amount of risk in the past, how bad did it sure. get? And we go all the way back to 1928 to show you this. So you'll know through all wars and depression and all sure. sorts of things that could impact all of us. And the bottom line is, is that if you're going to be a successful long-term investor based on all the good advice that we get from Warren Buffett and the academics and all mm -hmm. the people who aren't trying to sell you something, that if you just stay the course, dollar cost average, don't market time, nobody, I've, I've rarely met people who made great wealth because they were market timers. Right. I've met people who have protected against losses short term and maybe felt good about doing that. Sure. But long term, they paid a price in almost every case. And boy, is that hard to believe in when you see your portfolio going down. Mm -hmm. But young people, please understand, going down is good. 
when you're investing, for example, in the S&P 500 and the market is in decline, you're getting more shares every time you put money in there. Mm -hmm. Now, your grandmother and grandfather and your mother and father may not be all that happy, but right. you should take advantage of those low prices. Don't be afraid of them. I'm going to read something that you wrote. <clears throat> I'm going to let you finish the sentence. Quote from Paul Merriman. Investing has never been easier. Investing has never been more efficient. Investing has never been more investor-centric. That's the good news. The bad news is... There's never been so much bad advice. <laughs> this is the problem. Mm -hmm. There is so much bad advice. And if you can't tell good advice from bad advice... And if you don't know how to detect a conflict of interest in somebody, whoever's right. talking to you, right. you are at risk. You've got to set it, forget it, take your mind off it, but do the right thing from day one. And you go on and have a great life. It does not have to be about watching the market day by day, not even year by year. You need to save and invest intelligently. But the minute you let your emotions into the process, you are at risk of buying the story. They tell us, don't try to sell the steak, sell the sizzle, sell the smell, sell whatever it is that makes people's <laughs> juices erupt. That's what gets people to do stupid stuff. I always and tell I people, tell you, I'm supposed to be on a diet, but when I smell that steak, <laughs> <laughs> well, I tell people I'm all the time, but you know, don't buy the dream because you're going to own the reality. And I think that people are always looking for whether it's investing or losing weight or whatever it is, a shortcut, you know, yeah. and I always tell people that sounds too good to be true. And this definitely applies to annuities, but investment pitches in general. If it sounds too good to be true, it is every single time. Be between Paul and I, we have 90 years of experience, okay? <laughs> yeah. um, him 60, me 30. But the point is, we've seen it all. We've seen lipstick being put on the pig every single time. And if you leave the sales pitch or the bad chicken dinner, expensive steak dinner seminar going, that sounded pretty good. It's not as good as what it, I mean, the reality is not, uh, is not yeah. what you heard. And, and so if just I could add one thing, Sure. And I think it's important to understand and appreciate the difference between the courtship and the honeymoon and reality. Nice. And by the way, that's not just in the investment process. It's, it's about almost every part of our life. Exactly. And there is nothing more complex or potentially costly than the courtship because somebody is trying to present themselves in a way that they're going to make believe that they will love you forever, no matter what. You know, life is more complex. And, and, and that's a challenge because the courtship and the honeymoon are very, very costly for too many people in all different parts of their life. That is what I think you're trying to do, Stan. Mm -hmm. Certainly my educational material Definitely. is to try to let you see reality before you hear the courtship. That's a better way to do it. I always tell people I'm never going to be your friend, but I am going to be the best advisor you ever had because I'm going to, I'm going to be brutally honest. You do not want a can an oncologist to be your friend. That's you want true. them to be the biggest truth teller of all time. And um, that's what I tell people all the time in the investment world. You wrote something the other day uh, in a question. I'm going to let you finish it. And the, the question is, what does it take to be a star do-it-yourself investor? Boy, what a loaded question that only Paul Merriman can fill in the blank. Well, Stan, I think they have to be able to know themselves. Uh, investing is easy. It is very simple. If you choose funds with very low expenses and huge diversification and, and, and high tax efficiency, and you, you put it in a Roth IRA or someplace where it grows either you know, tax deferred or tax free, the, all that's left to be done is to understand who you are as an investor. And that is something most investors don't know. And this is why, as Warren Buffett said, it's good to learn from your mistakes. It's much better to learn from others' mistakes. <laughs> and the reality is yep. 
when you do what people like Stan and I would recommend that you do, mm -hmm. like people in a target date fund would recommend that you do, it's all done knowing what is probably, that's the word we have to understand as part of the process, probably. Investing, if you look at it carefully, is all about faith. And I'm, this is not about a, a, a religious, but it is faith that the market is going to grow, that the economy is going to grow, that capitalism is, is going to survive. And you can look at history and see a lot of good ideas that didn't survive. And so there is a certain amount of faith you have to have. But if you don't have that faith in the economy, and all you do is put your money in fixed income mm -hmm. investments, you are likely to have to work a lot longer mm -hmm. and live on a lot less because you weren't willing to take that risk of the long-term success of the system. Mm -hmm. I don't blame you for not trusting this system. Right. It could be a rotten system. But when you own 500 or 5,000 companies, you're not counting. Yes, yeah, some of them are run by crooks. Absolutely. There's no sure. question. I just can't tell you which ones they are. Right. I know they're out there, but right. that's just a very small part probably of your portfolio. But it's so easy. It is so unbelievably easy to set it and forget it. If you know you have the ability to keep your hands off the trigger. You know, boring is always good. Simple is always good. I always tell people, if you can't explain it to a nine-year-old, you shouldn't, shouldn't buy it. No offense to nine-year-olds. Um, <laughs> it really comes down to that. And, um, you know, in low interest rate environments, uh, you always see products coming to the market that are extremely complex with multiple levers. And you, you need an advanced math degree to explain it. And they can change the rules during the time you know, that's, that's, that's one of my big bugaboos with some of these really complex annuities is, yeah, you buy a 10-year policy, but you're really buying a one-year guarantee with a 10-year surrender charge um, because the annuity company can change the rules at their discretion every single year. That's not, that's not an investment. That's not something that you can pragmatically depend on. Um, and you have to be very, very careful out there. What... Um, what are some of the glaring mistakes that you continually have seen over your six decades? Like if you, if you and I, I'm not holding you to a number, but yeah. just think out, just off the top of your head, what do you just continually see people doing wrong investment wise? Well, I, I think there's a, a range of things that have to do with expectations. Hmm. Uh, let's say we are very optimistic about the future it isn't surprising to find out that those people don't have very much knowledge about how bad things can be. Their expectations are to the upside and they don't prepare themselves for the downside. Right. And this is why a lot of people need an investment advisor to watch over them, to keep, to keep them from doing damage to themselves. Mm -hmm. uh, I, that's the business I was in. I mean, I left, we had, I think, $1.5 billion dollars under management. I think the firm has $3 billion under management now, but those are all people that, that, that need somebody to take care of this for them. Right. Because expectations are rarely very good because expectations may come from hearing something on TV that made sense. And it could be very scary. It could be very positive, but there with every story, with every smell of the sizzle going on, there is more to know and people don't want to take the time to know it. I think you should never make an investment, one that you don't understand. And understanding index funds is dirt, dirt, simple. Mm -hmm. But also I think it's imp it is really important to prepare for the worst of times, not just the worst day, week, month, the worst five years. Right. Because that might have an impact on how you, how much fixed income you have in the portfolio, particularly if you're close to retirement. And so expectations, because people haven't looked at the facts, by the way, they're, they're past facts. Mm -hmm. And then people say, well, yeah, but it's different now. No, it is not different now. And this is the reason I say that. I think this is important because if you believe that it's, it's, it's not, the past has no meaning, then what you're going to do is you're going to ignore all those difficult times. And for decades, 
I told people, look at from 1929 to 1938. Look how bad it was. Mm -hmm. That is probably, probably going to happen again. Hopefully not in our lifetime. But it did. From 2000 to 2009, the inflation-adjusted rate of return was better from 1929 to 38 than it was in the U.S. with the S&P 500. Now, the good news is, and boy, is this important to understand, if you had a diversified portfolio of something more than just one major asset class, what they call large cap blend, that's the S&P 500, you would have made between 4 and 7% a year during a 10-year period that the S&P 500 lost money. And this is the beauty of building a portfolio that takes advantages of the yin and the yang and the ups and the downs. None of it's guaranteed, but you take the steps to defend. It's all about being defensive. Most people think of investing as something aggressive. It's about mm -hmm. offense. If you look at successful investing, diversification, defensive, low expenses, defensive, low taxes, defensive, all those things are defensive. And when you get into retirement, how much money you take out, defensive, because you're trying not to take too much out that you run out of money before you run out of life. Got to be defensive. Uh, you know, it's kind of like driving a car. <laughs> you know, I was thinking you're saying defensive. I'm a defensive driver. You know, people that aren't defensive drivers and the guys you see coming past you on the interstate at 95 miles per hour, that's eventually not going to end well. And I think the same thing can be said from an investing standpoint. One of the things I like about your site, Paul, number one with people, again, we're going to have his, his link there. We're going to have a link to his newsletter. You can subscribe to a free newsletter with Paul. Okay. But if you go to his site at paulmerriman.com, they have portfolios that you can look at. They have mutual fund choices of which if you drop it down, you know, they're going to show mutual funds from Vanguard, Fidelity, T. Rowe, Price, Schwab with the ETFs. I mean, this is gold people. I mean, they have the Vanguard, they have the best in class, best in class uh, ETF recommendations, the portfolios, they, ha they have it all there and there's not some paywall to get through to it. No, you can get it. You can get it. There's podcasts, there's videos, there's, there's, it, there's, there's so much there. And the reason I'm spending a little bit of time here, Paul, just to kind of sound the horn with people here is there's a lot of people that are charging for information. Um, mm -hmm. Paul's organization allows you to look around. And honestly, I'll be honest with you, Paul. I've when we build our new website and people that go to my site, it, a lot of it had to do with what Paul's doing. Cause you can go to my site you, have to, you know, you can run quotes and you can get books and you can watch mm -hmm. videos and you can listen to podcasts mm -hmm. eerily yes. similar to paulmerriman.com because I think we both believe in, you know, if you're doing the right thing and if you're giving the information away and you're educating, then people can make good decisions on their terms and their time frame. And I think that's what I like about what you guys are doing there. And you have a great team. I mean, uh, uh, you know, Paul, you know, I could go through all the people that work for him, but I mean, they're really, really good. And they're really, really smart. He mentioned Chris Pedersen, who's the director of research, but you know, Daryl also works with Chris, Darryl who's Balls, very, very, yeah. very smart. All you know, volunteer, Richard, by the way. Yeah. Richard Buck, Darryl you know, Chris he's there for, and, and Aisha, and Margie, the all of those yep. people, Renee, yep. all of those people um, are there to educate you and get the, and honestly get you through these times right now. These are, these are weird times. Um, and, uh, you know, it's going to be interesting to see if the Fed raises rates and what happens with Putin and what happens with China and what happens with inflation and what happens in the midterms. And, but as you said earlier, there's always something, it's always been like this, right? Yeah. And, and, and Stan, I think another thing that's unique about our work and we have a, we're actually a nonprofit foundation, so mm -hmm. we really aren't trying to make money at all, but uh, I think what is important is that we have tried to design our work so it's available and helpful to people of all ages. So yes, we have these portfolios of Vanguard and, and then the ETFs and all, but mm -hmm. we have a conservative and a moderate and sure. an aggressive, and we have an all value and we have a uh, and an all small cap for people who want to have a worldwide small cap value portfolio. We have four funds U.S. We have four funds. They're all built to meet the needs of different kinds of investors. 
and as I said before, we have a lot of people who follow our work for newborn children. I love it. Because we really are trying to encourage parents and grandparents to do some very low cost, simple things to get a, to give their children and grandchildren uh, a head start. And we tell you exactly how to do it. And in no case do I ever get involved in the doing it because I don't do anything except teach. Which I is enough, which best. by the way is enough. That's enough. That's a, uh, we hope. It's enough. It's <laughs> enough. Hope. By the way, Paul has written eight books. Paul, is there a number nine on the way? Is it? Well, uh, yeah, yes, there is a number nine on, on the way. And, and, uh, but I don't think it's going to come for a couple of years because believe it or not, what I want before I die, uh, which I hope will be more than a couple of years, uh, I do want to produce a book. My wife, she, she just chastises me for anything over seven, but I, I want to write a book about the 1,000 things you should know about investing. And by the wow. way, that 1,000 things will include 200 quotes. And I am a huge believer in great quotes to help us stay the course. John Bogle, Warren Buffett. I mean, there, there are so many great quotes that if you just remembered that quote when you started to pull that trigger, oh no, I'm supposed to, I'm a buy and hold or don't do this. Those kind of things help. And then you're going to find a couple hundred myths of investing. Right. I don't know all the myths. In fact, I should come to you, Stan, and you could help me build the myths Oh around annuities. Oh my goodness. Yes. I, I need to write that. I could write that book today. One of the greatest <laughs> quotes I've, I've heard is some Steve Jobs is simplicity is complex. In other words, staying in your lane is hard. Um, it, it sounds easy in function, but, and, but the implementation is always tough. And I always tell people whether it's investing and what Paul's doing, and he does this all the time, and whether it's annuities, keep it simple. Keep it very, very simple. And Warren Buffett's, you know, we keep referring to him, but yeah. he always said, if I don't understand it, I'm not going to invest in it. And what does Warren Buffett own? Coke and candy stuff and insurance. Yeah. He understands it. I think it's that simple. It really is. Don't you think? I do. And interestingly enough, a portfolio of value asset classes, different indexes, have for the last 15, 20 years produced a, a very similar return, maybe even better than Warren Buffett. It, you don't have to be Warren Buffett to get exceptional returns. You just need to be in the types of asset classes that have historically paid a premium for, then that's what, that's what he's been doing for, for what, 50 years back to the mid, the mid seventies. Yeah. Yeah. He was buying companies that were, really good deals. Remember, it's a not about the price you pay, it's about the value you get. He was always on the value end of investing, and his teacher was, was Benjamin Graham, who is sure. the father of security and anal uh, analysis. analysis. And, we and, all read uh, that book. You know, it's funny that you bring that up, because that was the first book I read in 1986, mm. when I decided to, that's, this is where I was headed. I was headed in the, in the, in this world. That's two great. More, two more questions. Yes. If anyone, by, by the way, if anyone wants to read a good book, Security Analysis by Benjamin Graham. For people like Paul and I, that was like the intro book. That was the book you read to kind of get it, to understand it. Um, and it's still, it's, it's timely to this day. But, but I, might, I might add that it created a complexity to, to, to which people don't have to go to be a successful investor. I agree. In fact, that. at the end of his life, Benjamin Graham said that something like an index fund, without all the fancy formulas that he tried to apply, right. would likely be just as good as what he did. Mm -hmm. and, 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 and so uh, that's where you'd have to read all of his stuff until you get to that final and <laughs> end of his life. I before know. you learn the secret to success from Benjamin Graham. Final two questions. Here's the first yes. one. You've been yes. doing this for six decades plus and, you know, hoping and praying you're here for another one decade because you, so. you, you. we really want you here. What in the past two years, 18 months, year has surprised you that you really 
or, or is there anything that surprised you? Is something like you just kind of said, wait, that's, that's interesting. I, I wasn't expecting that, or that was a unique stat. Anything that jumps out at you? Because I would love to know what your brain finds inter interesting. Well, I, I find it very difficult to deal with the complexity we have in our society today. Mm -hmm. uh, I, uh, I've always worked really hard to understand the other person's beliefs. Mm -hmm. Some of my best friends, <laughs> totally, I totally disagree with the things they believe in. Sure. But it's never been like this, the things that we disagreed about. I know. That has been very hard on me. The other thing is, and I just, I just love it when I can say, I told you so. <laughs> and I and I mean that in a, the, the most calm and generous way. And that is, I look at what we just went through. And if you didn't know what the market did for the year that we went through something, and somebody said, I guarantee you in the next 12 months, here is what we're going to have happened to us. Mm -hmm. Do you want to be in the market or out? I can guarantee you that most people would want to be out of it because it sounds so scary. Mm -hmm. And the fact is the point at which the market is really, really scary to me is when it's really, really high because mm -hmm. that, that is in essence a point at which it might be things are so good. I don't know how it could ever be better. Boy, am I feeling good. <laughs> right. You know, when things are too good and they can't get any better, that's bad. If things are terrible and can't get any worse, that's good. <laughs> and it's hard to get that em uh, uh, emotion uh, right as an investor. Right. Because most of society, when things aren't going well, want you to listen to them complain and tell you mm -hmm. why it's, you know, how we could fix this and why isn't it being fixed? And it's all very kind of pessimistic in nature. Mm -hmm. And it keeps people from doing the, the right thing for the long term with their investments mm -hmm. because they are becoming what they all believe they shouldn't be. They become market timers. They decide they should move more money into large or more money into small companies or mm -hmm. more money into bonds, or they should be moving around and Wall Street wants you to move around. They can't make any money if you don't move around. So you start moving around and you say, I don't believe in market timing, but you are market timing. Most of you use what I call the I can't stand it anymore market timing system. <laughs> well, and in it's these times- costly. Fear and greed rear its ugly head from a sales pitch standpoint. You're, they're either selling you the fear or the greed. And yep. it, it happens too often in the, uh, certainly in the annuity industry, which, which makes me laugh out loud because you're buying a contract. There is no fear and there's no greed. I mean, it's a contract. So um, one, last, one, one last thing. And, um, and first of all, before you answer it, you know, Paul Merriman's a national treasure to me. Um, and, and he wrote something to me the other day that I, I underlined and, and stuck it on the speaker beside my um, screen. And it said, I'm having a ball and celebrating every extra day I'm getting in life. I absolutely am, Stan. It is, it, it, it is amazing. I get up between three and four in the morning, sometimes a little earlier, and uh, rarely after four. And I am immediately reading articles about our industry. I, now I'm playing mm -hmm. Wordle. I get up and do Wordle <laughs> first thing. I don't know Good. if you're doing Wordle. Keep that Wordle, brain moving. I like that. But, I, but I've missed one so far, and I'm just uh, <laughs> so sorry I did. Uh, and, and, uh, and I love answering emails. I love helping people. Yeah. I love, honestly, I love believing that the work that we're doing is changing lives. And I don't care if they don't remember my name 50 years from now, but I'm hoping they will remember the point in their investment career where they finally got it right. And by got it right, I don't mean got the best return in the world. I mean, got a return and a combination of investments that they could have a sense of peace of mind, along with a reasonable piece of the action. That's what we're, because we always know what we should have done. There is no risk in the past. Mm -hmm. And so we're always dealing with the unknown. 
Mm -hmm. And if we can find a way to put a portfolio together that we can deal with the unknown and stay the course, I have done a, a good day's work. That's what I'm here for. I always ask my celebrity guests like you, a, a mic drop moment, and you just did it without me asking. That was the last question, and you, you did it. <laughs> but, but rest assured, Paul Merriman, your legacy is, inta <clears throat> is intact. Yeah. And, um, very kind. Thanks. and Thank it's you. intact Thank and, and the evergreen content that you have put out there and the team mm -hmm. that you put in place, um, you know, will be helping people for generations to come. Um, I want to thank you for being on the program. And I want to thank every single person listening to Paul and I on every major podcast platform and on the Fun with Annuities YouTube mm -hmm. channel. And we'll see you next week. Thanks for listening to Fun with Annuities. Please hit the subscribe button and make sure to go to my site at theannuityman.com where you can run your own SPIA, DIA, and QLAC quotes and see a live feed of the best MIGA fix rates in the country and even get indexed and income rider quotes as well. You can also sign up for my six annuity owner's manual books and I'll ship them for free and under no obligation. I also encourage you to schedule a one-on-one -on -one call with me, Stan the Annuity Man, so we can have a full discussion of your specific situation. It will be the best brutally factual and truthful advice you will ever get, and that's one guarantee you should definitely take advantage of. So join me next time for the number one annuity podcast on the planet, Fun with Annuities.